everyone. Welcome to yet another Journal Club with Distributor First on YouTube Live. We have with us a very special guest tonight to discuss motion sickness, and she is Dr. Rachel Wellens. She's a physical therapist, professor, chair of the vestibular subsection of the American Physical Therapy Association, and I'm sure she has a few more things to list off for us. I'll let her continue her own introduction. We're so happy to have you, Dr. Wellens. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good to join. Um, thanks for having me. Um, uh, just a little bit about my background. I've been a physical therapist for um, over 18 years, a uh, graduate of University of Scranton. So if there are any Scranton grads um, out there listening, um, that's wonderful. Um, I am, as uh, Helena said, an associate professor at LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans. Um, and in this role, I get to teach, do research, um, and see patients. So it's pretty much the ideal job for me. Um, I've been interested in vestibular rehab and doing vestibular, well, interested since PT school, but doing vestibular rehab um, for about 16 years of my career. So I'm really happy to share my knowledge with you guys. Wonderful. All right. So we're going to jump right into our article because we have a lot to cover. <laughs> Motion sickness is complicated. <laughs> and uh, so I'll do some article review and Dr. Wellens will help share uh, her own experience as an educator as well as a clinician. So should be good. So let's go ahead and switch right into our PowerPoint. There we are. All right. Great. So here we are with uh, our opening slide, the article, uh, Beyond Sensory Conflict, the Role of Beliefs and Perception in Motion Sickness. So I like to always give a little bit of background because although the article does a nice job, I think sometimes we just need to indicate one step further past the researchers. <laughs> so uh, we're going to kind of differentiate. Motion intolerance um, is kind of any sort of symptom, nausea, vomiting, et cetera. Uh, you see there's an extensive list here, even headache and or, so it could be any one of the above or more, induced by self-movement or travel, resulting in an impaired function, such as an inability to drive, work, or just tolerate being a passenger. Um, so this could be land travel, um, or you could be at sea, uh, in a plane or uh, even an astronaut <laughs> in space. And so, you know, some people consider that essentially to be motion sickness. Um, and there's also another fancy term out there called kinetosis. If you're into Greek and Latin roots, you could figure that one out. <laughs> so um, another term I want to make sure that everybody knows about is visual vertigo, and we'll get to that in a minute. But let's just talk about kind of some of the original ideas behind causes of motion intolerance. So in the 1960s, uh, they recruited some men from uh, Galdoth College, or now university, uh, for NASA to experiment to understand how space flight would affect astronauts. And of course, we can understand why NASA would be interested in motion sickness. <laughs> um, so they found that um, the folks who were deaf from this college uh, were immune to motion sickness. And they figured out the reason why is because uh, the cause of their deafness also was the cause of a bilateral uh, complete vestibular loss. So they had both. Um, in their particular case, it was a, a condition that was more common at the time, uh, luckily less common now, at least in the US, called spinal meningitis. Um, so it was an interesting discovery and it kind of led to some of the theories that we have about the causes of motion sickness. Uh, and the main theory proposed uh, by Reason and Brandt, I believe, is this kind of conflict of motion information. So, you know, the vision is telling us one thing about what's happening and the vestibular system and, and not to really exclude some other information systems like our proprioceptive, our body information system, right? Um, they're all, uh, if there's anybody's in disagreement with somebody else, <laughs> um, and the eyes and the inner ear are the most common here with motion, um, we could get this kind of sense of, hey, something's not right, and we get some of these symptoms such as nausea, dizziness, etc. Um, and specifically, 
it appears that um, these symptoms will probably not kick off unless uh, the current pattern um, of these rearranged motion signals is not what we expect um, based off of previous experience. So this makes some sense and we can see uh, kind of why these theories kind of came about based off of that uh, kind of early set of studies. Um, now, based on your understanding, Dr. Wellens, is that um, kind of consistent with your understanding of kind of the basic theory of, of motion sickness? Anything to add in that area? Um, no, just the just the fact, Penny, you were making earlier that the having an intact vestibular system is key to um, having motion sickness. Very good. All right, and and intact is is a mixed thing. So you know, having one inner ear giving information and not the other, it's still getting information from the vestibular system. We can agree on that as well, right? So it may not be completely intact, but <laughs> at least getting some information, uh, definitely important. So certainly, there's also something we talk about in on and off uh, quite a bit within the vestibular world called sensory integration, right? So kind of the information, kind of being brought in from multiple sensory systems and kind of mixing that with other information and then getting outputs. So, you know, we have the emotional centers of the brain, very important, as well as our kind of body information, including from the organs. So even, you know, how's our stomach feeling? So this is kind of where it's like, oh, I don't feel right in my stomach, even though it's the brain telling us things aren't right. right? So we kind of have these kind of information going out and information coming in from these multiple systems. Um, so they have found that motion sickness sensations can trigger anxiety and fear. And if someone is rating themselves higher on anxiety and fear, they're more likely to rate <laughs> their motion sickness as higher, right? So it's kind of circular in a way, but um, it makes some sense. And then even your body position, which actually can impact the sensations, say, coming from your stomach um, or the diaphragm in the abdominal area, they find that um, people who... Um, are lying down, you know, we kind of know this is like what you tell people when they feel sick, right? <laughs> oh, lie down, you'll feel better, right? So it's kind of calming the sensory system in a way, um, but kind of giving less input by saying, okay, you're going to kind of not get as much input when you're lying down. Um, is that also something that you're familiar with, Dr. Wellens? Does that resonate for you? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a lot of layers to the onion, as I like to say frequently. <laughs> um, and that's why we're kind of seeing um, some sort of diagram like this <laughs> about motion sickness now. All right, so we can see how there are many brain centers involved, as well as, you know, kind of sensory system coming, uh, information coming from different sensory uh, systems, as well as, you know, the autonomic system kind of being in the game, which is, a, you know, a part of our nervous system that maybe we don't always think about as much. And, uh, you know, I think that some of these terms would be like, whoa, that's a lot to take in, but really it's just kind of, everybody's supposed to talk to everybody and be on the same page. And when that's not happening, you know, our body might, our brain is kind of saying, hey, this isn't right. And so we get some of these symptoms. So this is an interesting fact um, that you might be aware of, and I'll ask you, uh, Dr. Wellens, do you find, I don't know, perhaps I should start with, do you have an attacked vestibular system? <laughs> yes, okay. And do yes, you, I do. <laughs> okay, and do you get motion sickness? Um, no, I really do not, and actually, um, I mean, on rare occasions in my life, have I, um, but I was always fine. Like I would, I can read in the back seat for, you know, and be fine. I can go on rides. Um, I'm a scuba diver, so I can be upside down and doing crazy things and it, it doesn't bother me. That's really great. Uh, so for those who are a little more sensitive and we can talk about some of the risk factors, uh, for that in a moment. Uh, it's interesting to know that it is rare to feel motion intolerant when driving. And the reason they believe this is the case is that a driver can predict kind of what's happening because they're in control. And we're going to kind of learn more about this later on, but kind of this ability to kind of know what's happening or what to expect, what's going to happen next. Well, I know I see a red light, I'm going to be stopping. Um, oh, it's, you know, a car coming up quick and I have to stop hard. You know, whatever's happening, the driver is kind of, has a better sense, hopefully in general, <laughs> unless something unexpected can happen to the driver, but usually, you know, they're kind of in control. Um, and so unlike someone who's riding, uh, you know, in the car who does not have that control, um, you know, 
the driver is able to really kind of anticipate and they seem to think that that helps because then the brain is kind of ready, right, for these different sensory inputs like a sudden stop or, you know, whatever is happening. So interesting stuff. Um, I do want to point out too, because I think sometimes patients even say, oh, well, I get motion sick when I ride on a roller coaster. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> that could be reasonable, <laughs> even though Dr. Wellens can handle about anything. Uh, it is normal, you know, to get motion sickness with the right or the kind of expected, you know, like level of stimulus. So there's a study that said that basically you could make almost anybody, again, excluding those without <laughs> uh, an intact vestibular system, motion sick with a sufficiently strong stimulus. Um, and they give this example of being in a small raft on very rough seas. Um, and so what we really want to focus on, I think, as clinicians is people who, you know, this motion intolerance impairs their ability to function in their particular life and work. So somebody needs to travel regularly for work, that's different than somebody who never needs to, um, and so on and so forth. So you do have to take that individual situation into consideration. Now, um, getting to another level, we know that motion sickness could be caused by real or perceived motion. So you could be riding in a car, or you could be in some sort of a video game situation, virtual reality, headset, um, maybe a lot of those IMAX theaters, <laughs> right? Things like that. So, um, you know, it's another layer of information for us to say, well, why would, when you're not even moving, you know, how could that make you sick? Um, and I'm gonna give some more details, but um, just kind of an early thought from you, Dr. Wellens, on kind of your experience either personally or kind of uh, literature you've read about kind of this visually induced um, motion sickness or kind of symptoms from that. Yeah, and what, what you're seeing, so some of the reading I did today, when you're looking at a lot of the visually induced um, motion sickness, a lot of times it's the visual stimuli in your peripheral vision, not so much in your central vision that's going to uh, drive those changes because um, you know when you're focusing on something and using your fovea, there's a little bit of a suppressive um, effect. So that's why um, someone may not feel so motion sick when they're like working on a small screen or looking at a small TV, but something very big and immersive like an IMAX is going to um, cover is going to be worse. So that could be a great point for us to start off as therapists. You know, if some, we have someone who's induced um, with motion sick by busy, visual stimuli, maybe we start out with a smaller screen if we can or, or stimuli and then progressively get bigger and bigger. Right. And what you're kind of hinting at, and we'll cover this more, is kind of uh, the possibility to habituate, meaning getting someone to really be exposed to the stimulus they you know, might find bothersome, but in a way that, you know, would be more um, kind of tolerable, small amounts, things like that. And you're basically training the brain, right? So we know the brain is a learning machine. Um, and just as it maybe has learned to be sensitive to motion and even starts to have this fear factor, <laughs> well, I don't even want to look at those lines. Well, okay, you didn't even look at the lines yet and you already <laughs> reacted to a visual pattern that, you know, historically has bothered you. So it makes sense, right? Um, so we're trying to kind of retrain the brain, um, if I have that right. Cool. Well, we'll learn more about I will be asking you if you've ever actually successfully done that, and if you can tell us more about your experience with that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about risk factors to motion intolerance briefly. Um, and this can kind of be, again, a mix of people who are sensitive to self-motion or and or visual motion, by the way. Um, so they have found in the literature so far that females in general uh, are more bothered than males, although there have been theories proposed that <laughs> sometimes certain groups don't want to report symptoms, um, and so they may kind of under-report. Um, I'm not trying to say that they want to look cool or macho, but uh, it's possible um, that that may be part of why we see these, some of these differences, because you know, self-sensitivity to motion sickness, unless you're actually uh, to the point of getting sick, um, it is how you perceive it, how you're feeling it, and then how you report it. So it is, it, even though the physiology is real, the the subjective aspect is, um, you know, still subjective. So it's what people report, and that's why studying this again can be very difficult um, because you have to lean so heavily upon uh, the person's report. 
Uh, we know that people with a history of migraine um, have a five time greater incidence of motion sickness and sensitivity. And they've actually had this as kind of being a, not a primary criteria, but kind of another way as you're kind of seeing a patient who you suspect is having migraines, whether they be headaches or vestibular migraine, which is kind of more dizziness um, imbalance presentation of a cranky brain, as I like to call the migraine. Um, but either way, um, you know, that group, um, if they are saying, oh yeah, I've always been sensitive to motion, it doesn't mean that they definitely have migraine, but it's just kind of a hint uh, because that's such a common thing for them to co-present. Um, also, people who are pregnant, and there's theories about hormones that are kind of driving that aspect uh, of kind of increased sensitivity uh, to motion, and then brain injury and concussion, which kind of go together, um, both can kind of drive that sensitivity. And we could talk about why the the brains that have been damaged have trouble integrating sensory input already, <laughs> and then you give them a sensory conflict, it's not fun. Um, other factors, and I'm interested in if you've seen any of this um, that they have named in the literature is people with cervicogenic dizziness or whiplash associated dizziness. Have you seen that clinically at all where they kind of report some motion sensitivity as well? I mean, I guess like as a, I haven't really pared down to ask them like, you know, specifically about, well, I mean, I do ask them about the quality of their dizziness, but maybe not using those, those terms per se. Mm -hmm. How about brain injury and concussion? Would you say you've seen some motion oh, yeah. in that group? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, there is a proposed genetic link um, with a possible propensity towards motion sickness, uh, but we know genetics is, is extremely complex and trying to pin that down. It's certainly not a primary cause, but it, it could be uh, contributory um, that you kind of have a propensity based on your genetic makeup. And then sleep deprivation can enhance susceptibility. Um, I can personally agree with this one. <laughs> um, if you've ever gone on a field trip and didn't sleep the night before because you were too excited and then rode the ride, you're like, oh man, that is way worse than last summer when I went with my family. What's going on? <laughs> um, so um, what would you be your theory as to why sleep deprivation could make you more emotion intolerant, do you think? Um. Well, I mean, I guess you'd have to get a little bit more specific if it was sleep deprivation at the beginning of the night or at the end of the night, because they both do um, different things when you're dealing with like non non REM sleep at the beginning and your your REM sleep at the end. Um, but basically, in the beginning, your non REM is going to help with learning, right? So if we're talking about like learning and habituating and things like that, that's going to be really um, detrimental and. Um, then your REM sleep at the end is good for like memory, consolidation, um, repairing of, of the brain and things like that. So again, I think some of those changes that happen during sleep, we really don't appreciate. You can easily see how it would lend itself to this. Absolutely. And the brain just doesn't run well when it's on an empty tank, as I like to say, <laughs> and sleep is definitely our recharge button. So, but good, good specific points. I like that. Very helpful. Um, all right, so more factors, uh, recent inner ear infection or disturbance, and this makes perfect sense. So you're messing with the vestibular system. It's still trying to kind of maybe accommodate or kind of heal from an issue, but it's not a complete damage. So there's still input coming in. Uh, just one more layer to maybe a sensory mismatch there. Um, brain issues, any issue with the cerebellum would make sense to me because that is one of our kind of brain end of the vestibular system, if you will, kind of that processing center for motion and uh, that sort of thing. They do find that it's common in the ages of six to 12. Um, I don't think they really understand the reasons why. I'm sure we could guess. Um, that's a very strong developmental age between six and 12 where the brain is rapidly, you know, kind of growing and changing. So maybe it has to do with that, but that's just my own personal guess. <laughs> um, and any person who's had a change in visual function, again, makes sense for this visual, you know, somatosensory or visual or vestibular mismatch of any kind. If the vision system is just trying to accommodate to new glasses or any other kind of, you know, different eye situation and then throw more sensory mismatch on top of it, it's a lot to take in. Um, and are you familiar, Dr. Wellens, just from, you know, let's say getting new glasses, I've had patients report dizziness 
Um, do you know about that at all? Um, yeah, I've certainly heard, you know, patients report and also like, I always find, I mean, maybe it's a little unrelated, but with like my patients with bifocals and trifocals, when they're doing like VOR exercises, like they just, they just can't. And I've been blessed with perfect vision. So I have no idea what it's like to wear corrective eyewear. So like, I usually have them, um, you know, take their glasses off for that. Yeah. Good point. Good point. But I think, yeah, it's just a lot, I would have guessed for the brain to again, manage when that input is kind of shifting and not consistent in a way that they can really kind of, um, you know, utilize that information effectively. So like I said, getting deeper, getting complicated. So for children specifically, um, they did try to kind of do a few studies on that group and they did find that, uh, again, migraine variant, um, a common factor here, which we mentioned with adults as well. Um, some with vestibular deficits, um, but you know, others, it's just kind of, they weren't able to identify. So it's definitely, again, this kind of mix of kind of maybe a genetic propensity. They didn't specifically test for that. Right. So, um, you know, many potential contributing factors, um, and they did try to treat it in various ways with various levels of success. Um, so we'll talk more about treatment later. Um, some kind of obvious things that I would think everybody's heard of are kind of some of these, uh, alternative medicine uh, approaches. And, you know, again, the literature is a bit mixed. Um, some of these kind of relief bands, at least in the studies so far, have not shown to be effective, um, except for in pregnant women um, for one study, uh, which is certainly not a wealth of data on that yet. But again, that's why we always say we need more researchers out there to help us out because, uh, yeah, the need for knowledge far exceeds what we have today. Um, ginger can reduce vomiting, but not necessarily nausea based on studies they have on ginger um, and you know we know that some of these treatments really work when people feel they will work um, I think ginger is, is a good example for me <laughs> I feel like when I'm like oh I feel a little sick to my stomach let me have a little ginger ale it's like oh it's a little sweet it's a little bubbly it's a little distraction I don't know if like the ginger in the ginger ale is actually <laughs> having an effect or if it's kind of more of my expectation that's what I had, you know, whenever I was a kid, that was my mom's like, here, you know, you feel a little tummy sick, have a little sip of ginger ale. So, you know, um, it'll be good, you know, to continue again to grow the literature, but um, what is your experience on some of these? Anything to add so far? It was funny. I had a one patient who had, you know, severe dizziness and probably looking back, this was a case five or six years ago, um, probably a severe case of three PD. And she would come into clinic with ginger ale like all the time. And she would down probably three to four cans of ginger ale a day. And that was for her. It was like, she was like, this is the only thing that can give me some relief. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. All right. Good input. So medications, I'm not going to get into a depth. I am not a physician who would prescribe, but what I will say is that um, there are some basic recommendations and I've checked with physicians who have agreed with what's on the box. So um, those should be taken at least 30 minutes before the kind of expected activity that's going to bother the person. Um, very much emphasized to me by multiple physicians that no single medication works for everyone. Um, so I know everyone wants kind of the magic answer, but uh, with medication at almost never exists, I would say, because we have different receptors and we're different kind of um, ability to respond to medications. Um, one thing that was proposed to me by a, a physician who's very um, savvy is kind of this mix of espresso and antihistamine. I'm not specifically recommending this, but it was just an interesting suggestion because it's kind of this kind of reducing the drowsiness factor of the antihistamine so that they could be safe for travel. Um, but then allowing them to have something to, you know, kind of tamp down uh, their emotion sensitivity or sickness. Um, and, you know, under all cases, again, a patient should get approval of their doctor, even for over-counter medications um, due to potential interactions with other medications. So, you know, soup to nuts, just to kind of touch on medication, I don't think you can talk about motion sickness and ignore that that's a commonly applied and very much can be effective uh, option. So, you know, we mentioned habituation earlier, um, and there have been some very aggressive habituation programs out there for astronauts, <laughs> where they really put them through the, the ringer. Uh, have you ever got a chance to go to any of the training sites, Dr. Wellens? 
Actually, when I was on my hurricane, um, we, so we were impacted by Hurricane Ida. We lost power at our house for um, eight or nine days, and we spent nine days in Houston. Um, and we did go to the the NASA center there, so we got to see like um, took the tram tour through their campus. And one of the things was their whole like one of their training areas. So mm -hmm. very cool, very cool. Yeah, I have the luck of a cousin who um, has worked for NASA and. Uh, I got to see the, the big uh, swimming pool where they practice neutral buoyancy and things like that. Very interesting stuff. So um, for those who have tried to kind of address motion sensitivity through physical therapy, um, it definitely should be provided by a specialist. And uh, we know that the treatment, as always, uh, with physical therapy should be individualized to your findings on exam, focusing on the goals, uh, an appropriate uh, kind of progression and plan of care. So in other words, if somebody's had 20 plus years of motion sickness, uh, you can't expect them to get better in a week. At least that would be very exciting, but rare <laughs> um, and more likely to take time if you're trying to train the brain as we discussed. Um, so we know that we would want to do a, a good history and exam, um, looking at things like contributing factors. We mentioned a few. Have they recently had their glasses changed? How do they sleep? Things like that. Um, looking at their self motion sensitivity, their motion, their sensitivity to different situations and stimuli, as you can see here with the situational vertigo questionnaire is a great example. Have you used these tools? Any specific additional recommendations? Um, I, I use the SVQ um, quite a bit for any of my patients with visual vertigo. Um, and just always make sure you warn your patients when you give it to them. So that was uh, by Dr. Marisa Pavlov, who's English. So there's lots of great like English words in there. So it talks about like um, going to the cinema or um, in the lift, which is, you know, an elevator. Um, so just kind of wa watch out for that. And of course, anything greater than 0.7 is considered positive for visual vertigo. Um, the other tool I like to use as well um, uh, that is more American-based tool um, is the VVAS or um, Visual Vertigo Analog Scale, really helpful to 10 millimeter lines. And then you kind of put a mark and there's um, like nine or 10 different um, activities that commonly would produce symptoms. Fantastic, thank you for that tip. All right, so our treatment plan, we're gonna address the deficits we find. Again, that gradual exposure to a stimulus, we give specific cueing. So it's not about, oh, you don't like spinning? Here, let's spin you and spin you some more and then spin you faster. There should be kind of a, all right, feel where you are or look with your eyes to, from this object to this object to help your body know where it is while your system is trying to kind of orient itself. Or, you, know, you really wanna kind of cue and pace um, and you don't wanna say, okay, let's just do this for five minutes because we don't know how you're gonna feel with it yet. You're gonna start light right? And then you want to build up. Is that also, uh, am I missing anything on this section kind of talking about symptoms and how long you should expect them to be elevated before they, you'd want them to come down? Yeah, I would say if that, like I tell my patients, if anything lasts more than 15 or 30 minutes, it means you were too aggressive. Um, and the analogy that I give to people, I always say it's like spicing the soup, right? You don't pour like all the salt in the soup you know, stir it up, taste it. And you're like, oh, it's too salty. Like you can't remove it, right? If someone's had a really bad experience with something, they're not gonna come back and do it again. So the analogy I always give, um, so when I used to live in Philadelphia was like, you were spicing your red gravy. I live in New Orleans, <laughs> I was like, you're spicing, you're spicing your gumbo, but you know, it works the same. Um, so it's like add a little bit of time, stir, taste, a little bit of time, stir, taste. And that's what we do with our exercises. So, you know, you do have those patients who are like hyper gung ho and type A and you tell them to do something like five times a day and they're like, I will give you five times an hour. And that's not any good either. So being really realistic with your, your expectations and your symptom level, I think is very important. I agree. And I've definitely, I've made that mistake myself um, because I thought I was starting light enough and I wasn't. So I had to learn how to start even lighter. And sometimes the patient will say, oh, this doesn't really feel like a lot. I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> like, cause it's sometimes yeah. it's delayed yeah. onset, right? Mm -hmm. And I always go by the mantra, like less is more. If you, if, if you're like, I tell my students, if you're kind of between like the less aggressive version or the more aggressive version of the exercise, start with the less aggressive one. You can always bump it up, but it's really hard to win back that patient trust and adherence if you've hit them too high. 
And the brain is- Which is the exact opposite of how I am. Like I see patients with like TBI and stroke and, I, and I'm the one like pushing you in the hallway and, and doing the, um, you know, the locomotor CPGs and 70 to 80% heart rate max. And it's like a totally different mindset. Yeah, the brain specific changes versus changing the body, muscles, endurance, I completely agree. I mean, obviously you could go too far on either, but it's so much easier to go too far on the brain um, not that it would cause permanent damage, but it, again, it's just gonna, you know, really not be productive. And you really wanna focus on kind of this gradual easing in and gradual progression. And then maybe they have a rough night's sleep and you gotta back it off. You can't expect every session to do a little more. Sometimes you will have to modulate um, if that seems to concur, you're nodding your head. So I think you know what I mean. <laughs> All right, great. So again, that visual vertigo, this is where we're really sensitive to visual input so a repeated pattern um, being in a big hallway or room open spaces for some people visually moving environments blinking lights busy stores grocery store target you name it a uh, train going past or a car that went to move past and it almost startles any of us could have that experience right but this is something where it's kind of consistent happens a lot for the person and the symptoms can be you know quite strong uh, for them so um, I want to define vection because that and we're going to get to our article finally here. <laughs> um, so vection they describe um, in the article, it's visual illusions of self motion induced in a stationary observer. So I, again, I think of like kind of standing and a train goes past you or a car goes kind of forward and you feel all of a sudden like you're moving, right? So this is kind of a conscious subjective experience of self motion, even though you're not. Um, and then also just to make sure everybody's on the same page because they talk about perception and belief so much in this article. Perception is what are my senses tell me is happening. Belief is what do I think is happening based on my knowledge of the situation and what is possible. Like, okay, the train's moving past me. I might have for a moment my perception made me think I was moving, but I know that I'm not on the train. I know that there's nothing, this, this platform does not move. <laughs> I've been standing on this platform waiting for trains for years and it doesn't move. So, you know, that's kind of my prior experience or my knowledge of the situation, even if it's a novel situation. I know that platforms by trains don't move. So even though I've never been on this one, it's not gonna move, okay? All right, so we get to dive into the study here. Um, they talk about how um, this kind of original theory of motion sickness that I just described to you all, this kind of incongruence between inputs versus a discrepancy between what is perceived and what is believed to be happening. And that is kind of more what their line of thinking is with motion sickness. Um, so knowledge on or beliefs about the actual situation represent a cognitive influence and their hope is that we can shape that, okay? So here's the study in detail. They got a bunch of healthy young folk, <laughs> perhaps from a year by university, I propose. Um, <laughs> they didn't have any disorders, normal vision, either at, you know, as is like Dr. Wellens or with contacts. Um, they excluded them if they're claustrophobic uh, or if the person had never experienced motion sickness because they need to be able to rate motion sickness. So that makes sense. And they use some questionnaires, including the motion sickness susceptibility questionnaire, which if it's something that you're interested in, you can certainly find it online. I found it very easily with a quick Google. Um, and I just want to give you an example of a question that they had, kind of when have different experiences affected you and how much, okay? And then they put these folks in this nice optokinetic drum <laughs> and they told them, look, either the chair that you're on might spin or this kind of background, these moving lines might kind of be moving around you. Um, so they set up that expectation um, and they let the person kind of have a way to indicate if they feel like they themselves are moving. Um, and then they uh, were measuring eye movements just to kind of cross check some uh, of the inputs. Um, so yes, they were informed that the drum and the chair could rotate independently, but they were kept unaware of what would actually was what was going to happen. So they put them in, and then they started spinning the drum. So it was the background that was moving, not the chair. Um, so those lines are spinning, 
and they kind of put it up to a certain speed and they told the patient or the participant to just be looking straight ahead not that they're trying to actively look at anything in particular just kind of keep looking straight ahead and then they used their knob on the armrest to indicate uh, where they felt they were and you know I think they made that clear in the in the beginning one side is I perceive myself staying still and the drum is rotating those lines and the other is I perceive myself as rotating and the drum is stationary. Now, Dr. Wellens, have you ever been in uh, any kind of research or um, kind of clinical facility that had something like this? I mean, the closest would be like a rotary chair. Mm -hmm. right, um, right. But other than that, no. Right. So in the rotary chair, they use to measure optokinetic nystagmus, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? And also for bilateral hypofunction, that's kind of like the purpose of it. Right. Very good. Yep, and I think they use this, or a version of this, um, at uh, Mount Sinai when they're doing the treatment for body dark mat, which is a whole other topic, but um, yeah, that looks familiar there. <laughs> All right, so um, they were rating um, their motion sickness on a zero to 20 scale, interestingly enough, um, and they kept spinning uh, that drum and making them feel things until... 20 minutes or when they scored at a 15. Uh, now it sounds like, uh, Dr. Wallens, you wouldn't mind being a participant in this study based on your non-sensitivity. What do you think? Uh, you know what? I, you know, I, I bet they offered some good extra credit for those students or, or pizza or maybe a little bit of both. So uh, college me would have been on board for that for sure. Understandable. Very cool. Um, so once they stopped the test, they asked participants some questions. Are you motion sick? Had them complete another questionnaire in case anyone's interested in that one. Simulator sickness questionnaire. It's a 16 question uh, questionnaire about different symptoms after someone has been in a, some sort of simulation environment to see what their symptoms are like. Uh, and then they were asked about, you know, what they, the participant really thought was happening. You know, did your chair rotate? And how sure are you? Did the drum rotate? How sure are you? Um, and it was interesting that kind of certainty <laughs> uh, question they threw in. Uh, why do you think they were asking about the certainty? What was your understanding from the article? Um, I guess to kind of look at the magnitude of the change, like right, like like what of a because having like a true dichotomous, it was they they just couldn't. Um, get at what they were trying to do. So seeing like rating the severity, and I think that kind of came into a little bit of their factor analysis. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, so speaking of the very fancy uh, multiple statistics terms they used in the <laughs> results section, which are definitely beyond uh, me, I'd have to really uh, go and review some things and look some things up to say I understood that section to be quite honest. Um, but they were definitely trying to get at this kind of difference between perceived and believed motion, the conflict BP. Um, and then they also looked at um, the fraction of time spent in full vection. So remember kind of perceiving, vection is perceiving that the, the drum is moving um, and you know how likely the, the chair was rotating. Um, so they were able to kind of create some numbers to try to look at when was the perception and the belief matching versus when was the perception and belief not matching. Do you have anything to add on this kind of mathematical section? <laughs> All right. So um, kind of I look to their conclusions. I'm kind of trying to trust them that they use the right math. Um, by using an optokinetic drum, um, they, you know, did kind of let the participant know that you know the physical motion was possible you know we kind of reviewed that that's what they told them in the beginning um, so the rotation of the visual surround induced periods of perceived self-rotation in all participants so in other words it's pretty normal because these are all normals like right? this isn't somebody with concussion with brain injury um, you know but just by having that much visual motion um, it could make them feel like they were moving so that makes sense right that is something that can happen to anybody um, but you know, when did they really believe, um, you know, that they were moving versus kind of being able to identify, you know what, um, I'm still, it's just the drum's still spinning. Um, and they were kind of switching in and out. Um, 
depending on the participant. I looked at the, the scatter plots they showed, and it looked like there was quite a bit of variance. There were some people who really kind of um, had those sensations, and some really, you know, had different sensations. So it really varied, even though they were all normals. So kind of what they concluded <laughs> is that, you know, these results fit in the general framework of a sensory re rearrangement theory, which acknowledges that, you know, even when you know um, you might move or you might not, or the, the visual environment might move or not, that it can be a bit confusing. And so, you know, we might kind of perceive, you know, a difference between perception and belief, um, and that would be normal. So um, that can certainly correlate with motion sickness because, again, at the end of the day, you know, when that discrepancy is there, the brain's not happy, and, you know, so we can kind of get this bad sensation. So um, they kind of go back to that original literature talking about the expected sensory feedback from previous experience, but, you know, they kind of took a leap here and said, well, even if it's unfamiliar, um, it still can be this kind of differentiation in the sense not so much of like the eyes and the inner ear not agreeing, but just kind of what you think is going to happen doesn't match up with what you're perceiving and the input you're getting. So um, that's kind of, I think, summarized on this slide as well. Um, and kind of the suggestion then for addressing or reducing motion sickness for them, at least from a visual motion perspective, um, is kind of when can we maximize a person's expected kind of expectations better, like how can we instruct them um, or kind of prep them. So they give a couple examples, um, and one is actually matched up with what I already discussed, which is how a driver often does not get motion sick, um, and even a passenger, if they can kind of see ahead to the road, right, so kind of fix your eyes on what's happening uh, kind of up ahead on the road, kind of look out as opposed to looking at a book, <laughs> which we know for some people can be motion sickness inducing, but if they can look out the window or kind of look ahead, especially towards where the driver was, would be, what they'd be seeing, um, that that would help reduce motion sickness. So uh, I have a son who's motion sensitive, and if he rides at the front of the bus, he's fine. But in the back, I suspect in part because he can't see where they're headed or what's going on, much more likely you know, to be bothered. So this makes sense. Um, and then they also kind of took another example and talked about just kind of telling somebody, hey, when you go up to the top of a building, it norm it's normal for it to sway. And for people to kind of have that in their head, you know, just by itself, that expectation. And then, and then if they feel that it matches what they thought was going to happen, they're less likely to get motion sick um, in that experience, kind of being at the top of a building. Because, I mean, they won't get motion sick, but just kind of to do, try to reduce that. Um, so then they also kind of, in relation to that, talked about mental imagery. Um, and there's a wealth of in information on wealth, uh, mental imagery in the neuro, neuro world, which I think Dr. Wells could, uh, you know, kind of tell us more about here in a second. But their example was an astronaut uh, getting motion sick um, in this kind of odd environment where you're kind of moving and rotating and it's a lot of motion in a, in a space environment. Um, that this particular astronaut was able to suppress nausea by imagining being on a ride that was doing exactly that motion. Um, so it just kind of allowed them to um, kind of say, oh, well, this is exactly what I feel like should be happening. So um, it reduced any discrepancy and they were able to tamp down their nausea. Um, so what do you know about, just in the general, not necessarily specific to motion sickness, about mental imagery and, and its effectiveness in treatment? Um, so, so, um, you know, thinking about a lot of the mental imagery stuff I pull in when I do my unit on stroke. Um, and so, and also pulling in some of, I guess, the mental imagery stuff, um, a little bit with mirror therapy, things like prosthetics and, and, you know, related somewhat. Um, but in terms, in terms of the mental imagery, um, one of the things that is critical from the stroke literature is that for it to be really effective, it had, does have to be prepared, um, paired with physical, right? So if you can't just do like, oh, just imagine walking better and you're going to walk better. Like you have to kind of, you have to actually 
pair that with gait training and you do get more robust when you pair the the mental with the physical as well so that i think would be a nice future direction to this to see okay if we if if um you know thinking as like a therapist to me like mental imagery like that's something that would be pretty easy to work into my exercise program so pairing that you know along with the physical interventions too um could produce some nice results excellent point yeah i think you know just people know, you know, usually what bothers them. So certainly being able to say, okay, you're on the boat or you're in the plane or, you know, kind of helping to set them up. Um, you just want to make sure that, you know, you're again, able to create some sort of habituation task that hopefully kind of stimulates some of the symptoms and kind of helping that patient put that all together would be a really great way to guide them as therapists is our goal. So when we think about treating visual vertigo, um, one thing I like to just briefly say is that, you know, if there's an active underlying medical condition such as, such as migraine um, and that's not being addressed, then your ability to make progress, I think personally, is limited. Um, so it is appropriate to refer these patients if they're not already being seen for medical management um, for their condition or suspected condition. If it's not an official, maybe you're the first one to suggest they might have migraine, um, <laughs> which many patients will tell, oh, I don't get bad headaches. I definitely don't have migraine. Uh, have you heard that one before, Dr. Wellens? <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but unfortunately, migraine is a certainly, I would call it a, a spectrum condition. Um, you know, they don't have to get very bad headaches in order to, you know, have a migraine condition. Um, so it'll be interesting uh, if they're able to get more medications specifically to visual vertigo. The only one they've trialed so far, they said have showed promise, but really they've only done like, again, one or two studies on it. So um, they may be more a medication option for visual vertigo in the future. Until then, again, physical therapy, this should look familiar. I know it's a repeat slide, but just to kind of remind everybody, um, you know, we're trying to expose them to a little bit of stimulus at a time. Again, not a no pain, no gain approach. <laughs> I think Dr. Wallens, you know, really emphasized that earlier. Um, and then, you know, just making sure that we're being specific to the patient and that it's gradual. Again, going back to, you know, questionnaires such as the VVAS or the situational vertigo questionnaire, um, you know, looking at what kind of bothers people and maybe focusing treatments, not to the hardest thing right away, but knowing that you're going to work towards um, right, so, you know, and, and it can really vary. I have patients like, oh my gosh, I'm fine with riding on a train, but I can't walk past the ocean because the vision of the way the waves and my periphery onto one side as I'm walking down the beach bothers me. So, you know, just really tune in to your patients um, and try to kind of think about how you want to kind of use something like screens and what you have available in clinic. You don't necessarily have the ocean, <laughs> you know, to try to kind of gradually, you know, replicate and gradually address um, their issues and not to ignore your findings. So if they have impaired saccades and smooth pursuit um, or they have an impaired uh, dynamic visual acuity, maybe they have a history of concussion and a peripheral hypofunction, these things happen. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Wallens has seen some patients with mixed uh, findings or, you know, kind of more than one vestibular condition, if you will. We want to just try to address those neck Again, certainly can be not necessarily a piece always of dizziness, but certainly a limiter to progress. So, you know, you cannot ignore the neck. Um, so looking at a lot of different pieces here. Um, I would like to know if Dr. Wallace has used any of these and, you know, kind of what, how you progress. Do you always start static patterns? How do you like to do it? Um, I, I like to actually, I find the disco ball is very hard for a lot of patients. To me, that's somewhat of a more, um, a little bit more advanced move. So I do actually start with videos. Um, what's nice about the videos, they can turn them off and I'll say, I'll say, you know, I, and you can really tailor it and there really is everything on YouTube. So, um, you know, I used to have a CD that I used that was a student project and they recorded all these various scenes around New Orleans. Um, but using, um, YouTube videos, great. Um, because you can just really find like your less busy ones and then gradually work up and being of course, um, really important to tell your patients that they need to be like symptoms level three to four out of 10. Like you touch, you touch a five and you shut it down and, and to really not to overstimulate. And then really from there, 
it's like real life. Like I want you to actively expose yourself to these things that make you dizzy um, and, and do those things because that is eventually the goal, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So virtual reality pros and cons, you know, there are some limitations um, but people do love it and it can be effective. So I don't personally have access to virtual reality and we're actually going to do um, uh, next 2022 in the summer. We have a plan already to talk about virtual reality as its own topic for a journal club. So get excited for that. Um, but I think it has potential for this group um, because it can provide that kind of more immersive if you're looking to progress them past more of a, a regular old video on a regular old computer screen. Um, this would put them more kind of with that periphery and all the things you're talking about earlier, Dr. Wellens. Um, and again, kind of working on visual dependence. We're trying to, you know, really think about the visual system as a whole um, and how we need to work on peripheral, um, kind of using the peripheral system better or being less bothered or distracted by it both, right? So um, I do have some peripheral tasks listed here. You can say to the patient, all right, I've you know got a piece of paper with an X in the middle and a bunch of lines drawn out to each side. Stare at the X, but go ahead and use your pencil and kind of just trace the lines. You're just kind of working you know, their ability to kind of focus on a target, but still kind of effectively um, you know, utilize the peripheral system. Um, playing ping pong is a good one. You're going to have them you know, working on a mat, but then at the same time having a, another task. So you're going to have to have them you know, read out letters that are on each side, so they have to kind of kind of glance. You don't want them just kind of use their center vision all the time. You want them to effectively be able to change their attention from peripheral to central um, in a good way. Um, and I, you know, we'll swing the, the ball at them and kind of throw little connector toys. I got this idea from Becky Bliss. So they have to kind of bat away the connector toy and call it the color, but they have to focus in front and find the letter. So being able to kind of dual task as well, I know for most vestibular patients is important. So it's another aspect of this that's nice, um, but lots of ideas there. Have you worked on some kind of central peripheral treatments in your experience, Dr. Wellens? And not yet. I do need to um, order some Mars and balls. That's definitely <laughs> like um, on my list. And it's not really something I've integrated a ton, but it is a, a goal to work up towards. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, definitely athletes, I think you see this, but I've been using it with uh, any of my patients really, um, mm -hmm. you know, just to kind of give them more options. And again, not beyond migraine, just know that there's other issues that can come into play for patients. So don't neglect those. Be sure to educate them, you know, on things that you know might be contributing to some of their symptoms. Um, so we don't just get fixated on, you know, trying to habituate them, but then never really address the fact that they don't get sleep. <laughs> you know, it's just not necessarily gonna have the same results. Um, so there's a lot of different tasks we can give them when they're viewing a busy background. Just look at this X that's on a piece of paper in the middle versus, you know, looking at the X and then turning their head and eyes and looking at another target and coming back. So we call that active eye and head movements or gaze uh, substitution, things like that. Um, actually doing VOR, which is much harder to me, looking at a, a kind of an object taped to the center of the screen, but just trying to focus on that target and move your head and ignore the background, much higher level. Um, and VOR times two, even harder, where you move the, your target opposite your head. Again, cueing is key. Say, I want you to ignore the grocery store and just look at that check mark, or, you know, kind of really getting them to, like, be able to hopefully um, just again, appropriately either focus or appropriately address a periphery, but not necessarily get overwhelmed and try to take in all visual input at once, right? Um, and then grounding. So I wonder about, some people don't like the term grounding, but I think you know what I mean when I say it, Dr. Wellens, what is your experience on grounding? Um, I, it's something I, I do a lot. Like I, I will say, um, rooting, like I'll use that, like something like yoga language, um, a little bit. And I will also use the term like keying into, and, you know, I, I, the language I'll use with my patients a lot is, you know, especially when their vestibular system is malfunctioning, of course, for a variety of reasons, like you're always pay attention to the thing that's screaming, right? So you're paying attention to the thing that's not telling you accurate information. Um, but that's not smart. Why don't you pay attention to the thing that is giving you accurate information? So I say, you know, like there's nothing wrong, you know, of course, my patients who have intact sensation, they will say there's nothing wrong with your somatosensory system. There's nothing wrong with the feeling in your legs and your feet, like pay use, learn to use those cues 
to tell you where you are in space. And I can't tell them how to do that, but I can kind of cue them to that's what I want them to do. Perfect. I completely agree. Um, so, you know, I think that this uh, Venn diagram I found really kind of helps us to look at visual vertigo effectively for treatment. You know, we want to give them little breaks, smaller chunks, gradual increase and pacing, pacing, pacing. So I might give them a home exercise program, but I'm like, I want you to do this one in the morning and this one an hour or two later, if it's feasible for their day, by the way, I understand that some people have more flexibility than others, but somebody who's say free all day, I do have patients like that, you know, really, I call it sprinkle, sprinkle it into your day and give your brain time to process and catch up. And if you do best in the morning, you know, maybe do a little more in the morning. If you feel like you're more of a afternoon after I've had lunch is my best time of the day, that's when your brain is kind of working the best. That's when you want to give that opportunity to learn, just like studying. As a professor, I'm sure you had to give some studying advice to your students as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to give a patient case, but before I do, I would like Dr. Wellens to go ahead and say if you have any specific patients with motion sickness that you want to talk about here. Um, no, that's okay. You can, you can go ahead and take it. Okay, so basically the patient that I have an example, she actually had a history of concussion. So she definitely had some ocular motor findings. Um, she definitely had um, some sensitivity to self motion and she didn't like shaking her head. No, things like that. Um, so, you know, we did work on the things I found. So if her eyes don't land on target, we want to work on that and moving eye and head together and, you know, kind of progressing that way. I did work on her ability to kind of just tolerate that self motion of a faster head turn, which is functional in the sense that we need to be able to kind of look back, you know, for driving and things like that. Um, she did have some balance issues. We worked on that. Um, I definitely, you know, had her be consistent at home. We know that that's so important for patients usually to progress. Um, you know, it's not about doing a bunch at once, but again, being consistent, as I like to say. And she was able to progress very well. And, um, as we progressed her habituation and kind of more like what I call traditional saccade training and things like that, I would have kind of what her findings were to try to address those, um, she did do much better. So I think it's, it's, you know, to say that we can get everybody better again if they have untreated migraine, maybe you can't. So you have to really look at everything, but I think it's good to at least consider that physical therapy can have a piece um, of assistance for these patients depending on their situation. Um, I'm going to offer to finish just a few slides very quickly on uh, strategies, you know, that you can kind of do if you yourself have motion sensitivity, which I know Dr. Wallens does not, but I'm sure people watching this, some of them are like, oh, this is me, this is me. Whether you're a clinician, you still can have these things. Um, so we know that there's some uh, basic advice that seems very consistently recommended. Um, and they found a distraction, again, for that cognitive component makes sense. Just have a pleasant smell, put on music that you like, things like that. Um, can help us. And there is some future technology coming out, um, a sensor behind the ear they're trying to do to vibrate to decrease motion sensitivity. Um, it's not yet available commercially, uh, but hopefully someday. And then even trying to get a car to kind of adapt and reduce, you know, kind of the inputs that would be jarring or problematic for folks. Um, so that'll be pretty exciting to see if they can get that <laughs> into the market as well. Um, so this is my take home message slide and we're ready for questions. All right. Let's go to our questions. All right. So Sarah, playing I Spy in the clinic. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Helps a lot of patients for central and peripheral vision. Do you do that Dr. Wellens? Um, a little bit like I would do, um, like where I put words, like I'll put, you know, words, but I'll have them sometimes do head turns too, to, to look and like read the words as we're moving. Mm, nice, nice, nice. Um, let's see, honey, have you take a have your t patient take off their glasses due to the lens interfering with their treatment? What do you use for a target when they can't see the normal size font? So <laughs> this is, this is where I, I know I'm going against like everything I was taught at courses. So I will say this. So I started out when I came home from the competency course, I was like, you need to have a letter. It needs to be three quarters of an inch. It needs to be this, it needs to be that. And I made all these sheets for people to do their VOR exercises and people didn't do their exercises because they didn't have that damn sheet with them. So I said, you know, you know what? I know it's not perfect target, but I use people's thumbs all the time. I say, look at your thumb. Cause my excuse is you always, you know, I say you always have your thumb on you. So you never have any excuse not to do your exercise. So 
I, I know I'm making sacrifices and it's probably sacrilege to say that, but to <laughs> me, adherence is more important than the actual size of the target. Maybe Michael Schubert with his, his um, research can prove me wrong on this someday and I will change if I get proven <laughs> wrong. But that's, I mean, that's just what's worked for me. No, and I think we And all- they're usually able, to, even without the glasses, that's like a big enough target for people to focus on. Good point. No, I think we all have to make adjustments to accommodate our patient situation. I think that's reasonable. I bet even Dr. Schubert uh, would concur. Mm -hmm. There's kind of the ideal, what works best. And if the patient Mm -hmm. can do that, that's what you should do. But then if you have to adjust it for the patient case to kind of get a result of some kind, and otherwise you would get nothing, sure, make the adjustment. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think we answered Stephanie's question in full. Uh, Pretty says, I learned the word surface orientation for grounding from my mentor. Have you heard that term as well, Dr. Wallens? I haven't, but that's a really good term. I like that. Yeah, it sounds more scientific. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it depends on the person, whether they would respond more to grounding, rooting, or surface orientation. But, you know, whatever works is what I say again. Um, I will make sure uh, I see someone wants the slides. I'll get them to that person. Um, I can try to post them after the show. Maybe I'll you know, we'll consider it. All right, sounds good. Um, here's another question. Is it just the habituation um, as they grow and some don't? So are there people who cannot habituate? What's your experience on that, Dr. Wong? Oh, did you maybe mean like for kids? Mm, mm-hmm. Like when you said it. I will, I will say this. My children have fur. Um, <laughs> and my little, my, my little puppy, we got her. She had such bad car sickness. Um, and poor thing, we, we, we're the type of people we drag our dogs everywhere. And that's one thing the vet said is that their vestibular system is still like developing and that's why they get so motion sick. So he said, you've got to be really careful. You don't want them to have bad experiences and they're always going to think the car and it'll make them sick even once they grow out of it. Mm. So we actually did have to like dope her to take her on some trips and she's fine now. She doesn't love the car, um, as much as our other dog does, but she, she deals, she's fine. Fair enough. Um, I was going to ask you as an educator, um, what sort of strategies do you think are most effective in educating your patients? Um, And this could be on motion sickness um, or, Mm -hmm. you know, exercises you want them to do, uh, anything like that. Are you a handout person, you know, just explaining it, demonstrating? Uh, What resources also could you recommend for those looking to improve patient education in the vestibular realm? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, uh, of course, I, I've, I've failed to say that the vestibular sig fact sheets are fantastic. Um, so I am a little bit old school. I do um, like to use them and I'll print them out for patients and hand them out. Um, but I think it kind of, you know, I look to see how people like to receive information, um, that there are some people who, you know, like to be talked to more. There are some people who, you know, like the handout and want to do it on their own. Um, but one of the things I do like to do is, especially when I give a patient like a handout, I was like, I'm going to give you this information. We'll talk a little bit now. We can talk a little bit more later. Make sure to bring it up in the next session. You know, and, and I did that just this week. I had um, a new patient with um, 3PD and, and she is a psychiatrist. So, you know, obviously highly intelligent um, and with the psych stuff. And she, um, I gave her this sheet and she came back and I was like, did you identify with anything? Is there any other questions you have? You know, making sure to always keep that conversation open. That's great. Yes. And um, I will try to put up that link. I mean, I'll add it to the slides before I put them up um, for those who are not familiar with the vestibular SIG um, information sheets. I'm sure there's one on motion sickness and also vestibular.org, which I hope folks are aware of, but they also have some good patient education sheets just in case, um, you know, you're uh, needing different topics as well. Uh, We have another question here. Anyone... um, have some tips to get better stimulus if the clinic speeds, so maybe like a quick head movement or kind of what you're trying to do, it's not enough to elicit a symptom, but they still get sick in the real world. Figure out a way for them to do the real world in small doses. I mean, sometimes there's that point where like in my exercise program, I prescribe life, I prescribe activity, I prescribe, you know, things like that, but making sure to really have those symptom parameters down so people don't get overwhelmed because we just can't replicate everything no matter how creative we are. Right. I agree. Um, and I think too, 
you know, there's something to be said for, you know, saying maybe like to mitigate, they're like, oh, I don't want to go to the CVS. What if I get sick and then I can't get myself home? Well, you know, can you take an Uber or maybe have a friend or, you know, kind of have, if offer, you know, just talk through the problem solving, the strategies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might seem obvious to you, um, but it might not be obvious to the patient uh, why they might not, you know, try something, um, even aside mm -hmm. from fear, but just kind of like practical considerations. Um, I mean, uh, perhaps you've probably seen this in clinic as well, Dr. Wellens, you know, then coming to therapy yeah. and then, well, how am I going to get home if you, you know, kind of you, you yeah. stimulate my symptoms? Yeah. Well, and that's a great opportunity to use a lot of the motivational interviewing techniques. Right. Right. Can you give me an example of that? Um, so what I'll do with my patients. So in the, in the example that you gave, like if the patient says, I'm nervous about going, um, to the CVS and I would say, well, what would make, what makes you nervous about it and get them to really clarify it. Mm. And then instead of you telling them like, okay, these are the steps or these are things I would recommend. You would say, okay, well, what do you think are the things you need to do or work on? How could that be successful? And having the patient kind of come to that conclusion and you kind of draw that in. And you also, you know, get them the buy-in was saying, how important is this to you, right? Like on a scale from zero to 10, how important is it for you to go to the CVS? Like that's a three, like who cares? Why are we going to work on it? But that's like, that's a, that's a 10. That's like my brand of fun. And that's what I do. Okay. Well, if, if that is so important to you, these are the strategies and things you've identified it's going to help because very often patients will will kind of hit most of the things and you kind of maybe say yeah i think that's a great option i might also do it this way or add these little things um but th those can be really helpful techniques to use with patients perfect i think that's brilliant all right well i'd love to talk all night um but i think that's the last of our questions from at least the crowd i have a million but we can talk <laughs> offline more but uh that was a really great conversation. Thank you so, so much for being our special guest, Dr. Wallens. We're going to wrap it up for tonight. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we'll hope to see you all next month in January. We'll be talking about vestibular toxicity with Dr. Gans. And until then, have a great night. <laughs>